Back in April of 1928, the yield curve inverted, predicting that a recession was not far off, as it has done time and time again throughout history. Now, of course, this was not just any type of recession because it ultimately led to the Great Depression, the most severe economic downturn that we've witnessed over the last 100 years, with the Dow Jones plummeting by 80%. And the unemployment rate in the United States reaching a staggering 24%. But between the yield curve inversion that we saw in 1928 and the top of the 1920 stock market euphoria, we actually had an almost two year period where stocks went up by a staggering 50% despite the recessionary signal from the yield curve inversion. Now we've seen yield curve inversions almost flawlessly predict every single recession in recent financial history. But despite the flawless track record of the yield curve inversion, there is lots of variation between the moment that the yield curve inverts and when the recession actually plays out. Between the 2006 inversion that took almost 16 months before the recession actually materialized and the 1974 inversion that actually played out for a recession almost immediately, it yields very different results. Now in August of 2022, the yield curve inverted, triggering the same recessionary signal that we've seen time and time again anticipate recessions, and yet the stock market has rallied significantly since the inversion as the US economy has not yet entered a recession with unemployment still hovering around 3.4%, the lowest level of unemployment that we've seen over the last 50 years. So we're gonna go back in history today, all the way back to 1929, and understand which recessions is the most similar to today in terms of the behavior we are seeing in the market from a performance standpoint, from an economic strength standpoint, what does the economy look like relative to other yield curve inversion, and also the strength of the signal that we are getting from this yield curve inversion. And of course, at the end of the video, we're gonna conclude based on all of these factors, which yield curve inversion since 1929 looks the most like today based on all of those factors, what that means for the economy looking forward and what you can do about it as an investor. Welcome back to Game of Trades. I hope you guys are going to enjoy this video. If you do, don't forget to click on the like button down below. It helps out the channel tremendously. And of course, subscribe if you are new here. Now, without further ado, let's get right into it. Now, in the 1970s, 1980s, we saw recessions appear very quickly after the yield curve inversion. You can see here in 1969, the yield curve inverted in June. And just five months later, the recession materialized and you actually had stocks continue to decline after the yield curve inversion. We saw the same thing in 1974, yield curve inversion. A few months later, the recession appears and you have the stock market decline the entire way through. At no point, you see a very strong rally in equities like the one that we're seeing today because the economic recession appears so quickly that stocks have no room to move higher after the yield curve inversion. Now in 1979, the yield curve inverted and the recession played out around 12 months later. And in 1981, it only took around eight months before the recession played out. But in both of those examples, you had stocks decline very quickly after the yield curve inversion, or at least very much struggle in the year after the yield curve inversion. Now, of course, that's very different to what we're seeing today. So the 1970s is actually not the closest template to what we are seeing today. Despite the fact that the yield curve inverted in August of 2022, 11 months later, we still have no recession and stocks are rallying significantly. In all of these cases of the 1970s and 1980s, you had stocks immediately decline after the inversion. One possible explanation for that is because of the oil shocks that we had in the 1970s. You can see here in October of 1973, you had the oil shock where oil prices went from around $3.5 all the way to $10 in a matter of months. Now, of course, such a considerable rise in energy prices took a massive hit 
on the consumer and precipitated the recession in 1974 and the same thing happened in 1979. Now, if we look at real consumer spending following the oil shock in 1973, that collapsed right after the October 1973 shock. And if we compare that to the oil shock that we had in February of 2022 because of the war in Ukraine, where oil prices also surged, you can see consumer spending held up very well. Now, the main explanation behind this resiliency that we had in 2022 and why we didn't see a recession immediately after the oil shock in February of 2022 was because the consumer had $2.5 trillion in savings back in 2022. So explaining the shock-proof behavior of the consumer back then and why the economy did not collapse into a recession despite the oil shock that we had because of the war in Ukraine. Now in 2000, we also had the yield curve invert. And back then it took around eight months before that yield curve inversion played out for a recession. So again, the recession materialized much faster in 2001 after the yield curve inversion than today. And in fact, the stock market began to fall immediately after the yield curve inversion occurred. That's very different to the dynamic that we saw following the August inversion where, well, first of all, it's been 12 months and we haven't seen a recession. And then second of all, stocks have been rallying since the inversion. Another big difference with 2000 is the dot-com bubble that burst leading into the recession, right? Dragging the stock market down with it something we have not seen in 2023 with the yield curve inverted. We've seen tech stocks surge and we've seen AI stocks reach very frothy valuations despite this recessionary signal. So this type of risk on behavior is not something that we saw following the 2000 inversion where it actually marked the end of the euphoric blow off top that we had in tech stocks at the time. We're seeing the exact opposite phenomenon which is not indicative that we are currently in a recession. Now, in 1989, you had the yield curve inverted at the very beginning of the year, and it took 12 months before the recession materialized. And throughout those 12 months, you had stocks rise quite significantly. So this is the first example where we actually have stocks rising following the yield curve inversion as the recession took around a year before really playing out. Now, this recession in particular was quite shallow. It was priced in very quickly by financial markets. But as I said, this already looks much more similar to what we have today in terms of the stock market rallying after the yield curve inversion. Now, the main difference that we have today with 1989 is how deeply inverted the yield curve actually is. It inverted only slightly, barely going to negative 0.5% and for a very short period of time. So financial conditions that really tighten when the yield curve is inverted were not that bad for not that long. And that is important because we've actually found the depth of the inversions to be a big predictor of how deep the recession is going to be. This is the chart that tracks the depth of inversions against how low manufacturing PMIs go. Now, manufacturing PMIs are just a measure of economic activity. And you can see deeper inversions on the left generally lead to lower PMIs in the 18 months that follow the inversion. So it's not a big surprise to see that the shallow yield curve inversion of 1989 played out for a shallow recession in 1990. Now in 2006, we also saw a yield curve inversion occur in around July of 2006. And following the inversion, you had the stock market rally significantly in the year and a half after the inversion. So between the moment that the yield curve really began to invert in July 2006 and the beginning of the recession, you had around a 16 month period where the stock market rallied and where the economy was actually relatively strong with the unemployment rate staying relatively low. So you could argue that the 2006 inversion is quite similar to what we have today in terms of the labor market staying relatively strong and the stock market being relatively strong. So one thing we can also learn from this example in 2006 is that the strength of the economy, the strength of the labor market during the inversion in no way predicts how bad the recession is going to be. In the case of 2007, the economy was quite strong 
throughout the inversion and ended up leading to the worst financial crisis since 1929. So hypothetically, if we follow the same exact path that we followed back in 2006, that leaves potentially another seven months where stocks can rise before a recession actually plays out and where unemployment begins to rise. But remember, the time that that takes to happen in no way predicts how shallow or how severe the recession on the other side is eventually going to be. And in fact, the perfect example of that is 1928, because we saw the yield curve invert in 1928. And in the year and a half following the inversion, we had stocks rally significantly as the unemployment rate leading up to the Great Depression was extremely low between around zero and 3% according to the Fed's website. We had an extremely strong stock market, an extremely resilient labor market leading up to the Great Depression. And of course, once it gave in, once the recession began, it led to the unemployment rate rising all the way to 24% and the stock market falling 80%. Now, as a fun anecdote, the yield curve is actually inverted to the same level as it was in 1928, just before the Great Depression. Now, of course, we saw the yield curve invert to this extent in the 1970s as well, and it didn't create recessions that were as severe as the Great Depression. So, of course, take that with a grain of salt. But now some concluding thoughts, some key takeaways to take home with you. The longest time that we've had between a yield curve inversion and a recession was around 16 to 17 months, and that actually happened in 1928. The second point is that the resiliency of the economy, the strength of the stock market during the yield curve inversion, in no way predicts the severity of the recession. One thing that does predict the severity of the recession is actually how deep the yield curve inversion is. Now, when we look at the price action of stocks, how strong they were, the resiliency of the labor market and the extent of the yield curve inversion. The most similar example to today is 1929 and 2006. Now, of course, in 1929, the stock market was a lot stronger than today. So we have to see how strong this rally continues to go and whether we perhaps see a type of 1929 melt up in the months ahead. And of course, the difference with 2006 is that the yield curve is a lot more inverted today than in 2006. But in both of these cases, the unemployment rate remained very low after the yield curve inversion. The stock market was very resilient, very strong, which allowed the Fed to continue tightening monetary policy for almost a year after the yield curve inverted for the first time, which is exactly what we've seen since August 2022. Now, what should investors do about this? Now, there's lots of ways to protect yourself against the recession playing out. We've done lots of quantitative work at GameOfTrades.net regarding the best allocation to have after a yield curve inversion heading into a recession, one of them being treasury bonds that systematically outperform stocks after inversions, the only exception being 1978. Now, now of course, 2022 has been an exception so far, but perhaps we'll see that turn around later this year. Make sure to subscribe to our website if you want to know exactly how we're executing these trades, how we're thinking about the possibility of a recession not playing out. Now, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you do, don't forget to click on the like button down below and subscribe to the channel if you have not already. Now, in the meantime, I wish you good luck on your trading and see you next time.